It's good to welcome all of you to Poets Corner this evening. Corey Wells is our poet, but she's much more than that. She's a writer, she's a storyteller, and she's an advocate for arts and democracy and all other good causes. She recently had po published a po poetry collection known as Sugar Fix. I'm sure we'll hear from that book as well as others of her poets' poetry this evening. And interestingly enough, she has been the first poet laureate of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Welcome, Corey, to Poets' Corner. And listen up, it's going to be a great evening. Hi, everyone. I'm Corey Wells, and I am so glad for you to be joining me to hear a bit of poetry and also have some talk about poetry and writing. Several friends and, and fellow writers have sent in some questions that I'll be talking about as I go through uh, this evening with you. I want to thank Poets Corner uh, at Scarrett Bennett for having me. I'm honored to be a small part of the programming that they're offering, um, that they've been offering for a long time, and that particularly they've been doing during these challenging times uh, here in 2020. So um, since it's autumn this week, I thought I would start with a couple of poems that are uh, about fall. Um, the first is called Fall Sanctuary, and it has a line in it by the poet Jeff Harden, who is another Tennessee poet who's also been at Poets Corner, but by all means, look him up if you're not familiar with his work. This is called Fall Sanctuary. I slept in a room that glowed with fireflies, though it was late autumn on a frosty bluff high above Lost Cove. The room was a salve of spun honey and light, and a hundred little window panes gauzed with tranquility. In a wide bed, I slept alone, surrounded by pillows and books, by poets I love. In the night, I lit a candle and a tiny string of lights against the darkness. They were comfort. So was the darkness. Outside, I found an astonishment of stars, a clear sky spangled and deep. How long had it been since I'd seen the stars? This is how I fell asleep, my skin on soft cotton, my body awaiting the gentle touch of fireflies, their silent sparks. This is how I awoke, unencumbered and enthralled, the early sun casting over the mountain autumn into my room, casting through the morning chill a stained glass chapel. A splendor of stillness, stirring. And one more poem about fall. This is called In the Secret Hour of Life's Midday. And the epigraph is a Carl Jung quote. For in the secret hour of life's midday, the parabola is reversed. Death is born. You'd think we'd be road-weary, but oh, the clear blue sky, the just right chill, these early morning Virginia hills veiled with fog. Look at the glint of garnet and gold leaves, dapple of sun and shadow, the fullness of the pumpkin, the lavish curve of the gooseneck gourd. Did you notice the modest stones studding the hillside graveyard we passed? We, too, are bound for the cold and reluctant bones of winter, but now, 
because life is ever closer to death. Now, because this death before us is so alive. Now, this beauty takes our breath. And at every bend in the road, I want to open my shirt and lean out the window bare-breasted in the wind, in this rush of loveliness. I want to shout to the earth, Take me. Take me now. So again, a couple of fall poems, and those are from my book, Sugar Fix, which is celebrating its one-year anniversary this very week. This is my first full-length collection, which came out from Terrapin Books. Um, and I'm also the author of a um, chat book called Heaven Was the Moon, and have some work on a CD that I performed with my daughter as well. So uh, particularly that second poem that I read seems to have, you know, a whole other level of meaning now that we're in the time of, of this pandemic experience. And so that gets me to the first of several questions that friends have posed ahead of time. Um, my friend Danny asked, if you've written pieces this year, has the chaos of 2020 seeped into your work? And Kathy asked a similar question, has COVID affected your writing? And, um, and so what I've been finding this year is that I'm not writing poems that are directly related to COVID, but I have found myself, I think, thinking and, and really facing in my writing more about grief and loss. And, um, and that's, you know, appeared in lots of different forms. And that's not to say that I'm all maudlin at all, because really, I think being creative for me, being on the page, at the page, is something that overall tends to lift my spirits. Um, but with the pandemic slowing down our lives, I think it's also given me more time to be reflective and also to sometimes connect with writers on Zoom that I was having trouble connecting with in real life. So there's been that little bit of a silver, silver cloud um, to the pandemic for me. So in those first two poems, you may have uh, you know, caught some whiffs of, of romance and the idea of desire is something uh, that you can tell, you know, from the title really runs through this book. Um, and this is a book about stories, about um, a lot are, are stories of my family. I grew up in a strong storytelling tradition, and it's how story shapes us as individuals, as couples, as families, um, and really ultimately even as a nation. Um, but to kind of continue this idea of, um, of just exploring desire, I'm going to read the prefatory poem in this book. It's called um, Dear Reader, and um, I'm sending it with a shout out to my friend Jenny, who I'm going to tell you more about in a moment. Dear Reader, it's true that when you're near, I want to kiss your cheek. Stroke my thumb across your lips, brush away the pretense of a crumb. It's true, I want to invite you to paradise. Or coffee and chocolates. Or beneath the covers of my bed. Yes, I'm more teased than temptress. Truth is... I'm simply lovesick on possibility alone, lovesick for the intimate, the tender, this sense of you and me. Think of us, a cozy room, an amber bowl of light, a sprinkle of sugar across the night sky. Would that not be safe and true as the stars? Isn't that what we long for? What I want for us is this, a warm and quiet place and time enough. Words, breath, 
turn after turn of page. Rhythm rising in our blood, insistent as the moon, round as our hopeful mouths. Again, that's Dear Reader. And that goes out to my friend Jenny Fields, um, who is a novelist. And her most recent book, I just have to give a shout out to, it's called Atomic Love. Um, it's set in post-World War II Chicago and deals with um, a woman who worked um, as a scientist on the Manhattan Project, so had a, a role in the atomic bomb. And quite a few years later, she's still dealing with that and a lot of intrigue that relates to it. And um, it is a really gripping story. I was lucky enough to read um, an early draft of it. And Jenny, I've got it on my bedside table, and it's next for me to start. Um, so anyway, like I said, just wanted to let you all know about that. Um, I think that relates to a question that... Um, uh, that someone else has, Todd, my friend Todd, who I think I met first at a Scarrett Bennett reading, uh, asked, you know, does reading inform your own writing? And absolutely. I mean, I, I don't read really without a highlighter. And sometimes it's the story that grabs me or makes me think of my own story that somehow is related. And sometimes it's just a great turn of phrase that, um, you know, I appreciate so much and that I you know, hope will turn into some great turns of phrases that I, you know, use in my own work at some point. Um, so to continue this idea of desire, here is a poem about um, desire, I guess, being at odds, if you will, with each other, some different desires. And this is called we climb onto the motorcycle of sleep. Um, and that phrase, you've figured out by now, I steal phrases from other writers fairly often, but lots of poets do. Um, that phrase is from a poem by Jane Gentry. Um, Jane was a um, poet laureate of Kentucky, and I got to enjoy just a short bit of time with her one year at a writer's conference, having breakfast with her and bought her book and really uh, fell in love with her work. But in this poem, she describes sleeping with her husband and having her arm, you know, wrapped around him as if she might be behind him holding on on a motorcycle. And I thought that was a really interesting image, but it made me think. We climb onto the motorcycle of sleep. Jane, I love that image. You holding tight to him, your white scarf shimmering in the night wind. It's how I sleep with my man, too. But Jane, can I ask about that roar you mention? Has it grown more noticeable through the years? As your irresistible bad boy free wheels through starry space, does he sound like a Honda Goldwing, a Kawasaki, a Harley? My man's like a Harley, a vintage model that rumbles louder with every revolution of engine and earth. A problem with a carburetor, I suspect. Why he sputters and gasps and even backfires once in a while, so deafening sometimes I'm tempted to adjust the choke right there in the darkness. I confess I've thought how much quieter a new model would be. But then we circle back into the morning glint of day, bright as chrome. Those old plugs still spark. That engine still cranks. And despite the dense pings and misses, the rides still smooth as sheets on the fresh made bed before we take the night on one more thunderous spin. So this talk of um, atomic love and carburetors and starry space 
brings me to my next uh, question that a friend submitted. And this is from Barbara Young, who is another Tennessee poet you should look up. She says, WordPress has a slogan that is, code is poetry. She says, I've run across quite a few programmers slash poets, but to me, the two don't seem to belong in the same universe. What trait makes Corey, the programmer, such a good poet? And my friend Jennifer Cates with MTSU Write also asked a similar question and said, do you find any crossover between the skills and brain parts that you use in programming and those that you employ while writing poetry? Um, So I worked as um, a programmer for many years. I worked in software development for almost 30 years and was a programmer for many of those years. And um, I love these questions because it is this combination that um, may seem unusual on the surface. But there are several things that programming and poetry, I think, have in common. And the first of all is just attention to detail. The specific details that you need you know, to be a good writer is just paying attention and getting down those specific details. I think so often when I'm working with students who are new to writing, they want to be vague and you, you want to talk them into using those details from their life because we all connect with each other, but much better when we share those details. Um, And of course, details are very essential to code because if you're considering the flow of a system and you want to know exactly what kind of outcome you want, you've got to understand that system in great detail. Um, Secondly, a thing that, that I think that programming and poetry has in common is that it's really helpful to be a little obsessive. Um... In poetry, I think that applies, of course, and in, in not just in poetry, but in all writing and trying to get to exactly the right word. Um, and also that obsession with just you've got to be persistent to reach some some level of success. And I definitely use those that in you know air quotes. But the path to publication, no matter what kind of path you're on, Um, It takes persistence, and to me, persistence and obsessiveness have something to do with each other. Um, And that same obsessiveness, I think you need when you are especially testing code and really understanding how, again, a complex system works and imagining what can go wrong. So, So that imagination applies, of course, to creative writing, but also to coding. Um... Both, I think, are, for me, about, you know, there's something I want to better understand out there. And so I'm writing to better understand it or writing code to get to a solution. Um, I could say more about that, but I won't. <laughs> um, I will say, I think there's so much room for creativity in coding. And that's something that people may not um, always think of. Um, And maybe me being analytical about poetry, I'm not sure if it really helps my process so much as it helps me maybe as a teacher in in talking to beginning poets about, well, how do we break down this poem? How do we analyze it? Um, How do we find what really works well about it? But anyway... So I came to programming myself because I really wanted to be an astronaut. I'm a child of the space age, and the astronauts were some of my early heroes, but it turned out I had really bad eyes, and so that wasn't going to happen. So technology ended up being, you know, where I went. Um, So that brings me to a poem, though, um, and probably one of my favorites um, to, to read and share with others is called So Long to the Good Old Moon. And um, that title comes from a Life magazine headline, July 4th, 1969. So it's when we were getting ready to go to the moon. And uh, Life magazine put out a whole series of um, 
of, of magazines, not just one magazine, but, but several uh, in that June and July time frame that were dealing with everything to do with going to the moon and what was it going to be like once we were there and was it going to destroy all these myths and things that we'd believed about the moon. So, so long to the good old moon. When I was young, I wanted to go to the moon but I've only made it to Milwaukee, which is to say I have learned about adjusting expectations. When I was young, I planned to move to the big city, any big city, but my hometown grew and grew in a labyrinth of commerce around me, which is to say only certain bodies at rest tend to stay at rest, not to mention good urban planning is a must. When I was young, I was going to drive a Porsche 944 flat on the floor, but I've been all four-door sedans and minivans, which is to say I had kids I was not planning, and a husband I was not planning, the latter of whom came into my life wearing plaid pants, which I was definitely not planning. Which is to say that love is the unbalanced force unnamed in Newton's first law, and I learned early on, one, to accept people as they are, even if they have no fashion sense. And two, planning will only take you so far. But love, love will take you everywhere, even to Milwaukee in winter. Which is to say, although I reserve the right to complain, we do what we have to do. Older now, I take uncommon pleasure simply anticipating an afternoon cappuccino from a powdered mix, which is to say, life is improbable. And if you look, you'll find a galaxy in your cup, perfect and round and spinning. So from the moon, let's move now to on this uncertain earth. We walk expectantly among the geysers, the land here like nothing we've known before. We might as well be on the moon or Mars. There's so much we can't name, vague cues we don't recognize until the moment they spew hot secrets. Look how the minerals rise and shimmer, how the mud simmers in pastel swaths how twilight last and last. Now in our room at the open window, we lie and watch, just watch, the cool thin air from which like magic bats appear, scores of them, to spin and spiral in the pine tops, because we all need to eat, and isn't a little dancing good for the soul? In this wilderness we've come to understand perilous, and more than that, precarious, and more than that, possible. Which is why we see now, through the fogged gloaming, beyond the bats and thick pines, massive buffalo grazing, and beyond them, a lone chipmunk skittering to its burrow. Soon it will be dark enough to see the Milky Way, and a million stars winking down on this yellow, bubbling earth down on our warm forms, almost lost among the soft spots, biding their time, hungry for something we'd rather not name. Again, that's uh, On This Uncertain Earth. And all these poems that I'm reading are from my book, Sugar Fix. Um, I think that's another one of those poems that just has this other layer now when you consider the pandemic. Um, so, um, to turn to another question from a friend, Mary Catherine asks, what do you see the role or responsibility of folks like yourself to draw attention to issues or solutions to our national social justice reckoning? Is there a role or responsibility? Do the arts give a special window to communicate the range of feelings Frustration, confusion, shame, helplessness, fear that so many Americans are feeling. Um, so those are some great questions. And I think that writing 
more than anything, being in the writing community for 20 something years now, maybe more than that. Yeah, 25 maybe coming up on 30. But anyway, who's counting? Anyway, being in the writing community is what has really brought me to a greater uh, diversity of, of people. And not just a, sitting down in a room and being among a diverse group of people. And that in itself is important. And it's something that not all of us white folks end up doing all the time. Um, but really, as I was saying earlier, hearing other people's stories is, has been just very formative in me taking on, um, I guess, work and causes and interest that I believe are for all of us. Um, that said, I think that as an artist, as a writer, whatever, that our first call, our first obligation is to whatever it is that's nagging at us, uh, that won't let us go. And, you know, whether that happens to be about something that has to do with social justice, that's great. And sometimes that is going to be the case. But, you know, it might be not. And that's OK, too. Um, anyway. I find that. I write about things that worry me. Um, and no matter what that is, whether it's personal or it's something that's broader of you know something that's going on in our community, in our state, in our nation, I think that um, it's part of how I try to figure out where do I stand on things and and also see the complexity of how so many different stories have to somehow come together and how we have to move forward. Um, so I don't write like super overtly uh, political stuff, I don't think. Um, but at the same time, I do grapple with some of these things, uh, some of these issues in this book. Sometimes in the guise of, of history um, and sometimes in, uh, through the lens of current events. So when I was a kid in like um, third grade, I can I was at a new school, so I can remember going to the music room and one of the songs that we sang was I Lift My Lamp, which is based on the poem, um, I guess, in spite, that's on the Statue of Liberty. Um, and the words of the poem, I think, were turned into a song by, I believe, Ir Irving Berlin. But here is a poem that refers to that. It's called, They Taught Us in School to Sing of the Huddled Masses. And now we're an odd and tuneless lot, crowded and waiting for a bus or maybe some crazy ride at a rundown amusement park, tickets clutched in sweaty hands. It's cold, but we're somewhere south. Or is it east? Everyone's trying to avoid eye contact or to preserve their personal space or keep the children hushed. None of it's working. We're overwarm. Our coats smell of stale grease and coffee. Someone in back lights up a cigarette. Or maybe it's smoke from a cross burning long ago. Or yesterday. A hazy stench first rises, then settles heavier than guilt. A few people cough, and now someone hands me a baby, swaddled and so small I know she's starving, maybe even dying. And without a thought, I lift my shirt and cut my breasts like a dove before her mouth. My pale nipple has not nursed a child in twenty years. The body knows. The baby latches on, weakly at first, then stronger, her nose so close to my flesh, I worry about her every breath. She suckles, and the milk aches its way from deep within. I imagine it thick and gritty, but the body knows. Little as I have, it will be enough. Dark strangers, I know her parents when they come. 
I hand her over with a small, soft block of something white. Maybe it's goat cheese, or a too obvious metaphor for grace, or manna in new convenient packaging. Or maybe it's an eraser, the kind draftsmen use to fix an error, leave fragile paper clean. So this idea of paper and what's written down brings me to another story that, as I've mentioned, this one based more on history and my family history. Um, This refers to um, a speaker in the poem by the name of Willis Guy, and he is my third great-grandfather. And I think what you also need to know in this poem, um, well, there's a reference to Porter Gee, which would be a colloquial pronunciation of Portuguese, which is what people of mixed race um, sometimes were referred to um, back in at least the 19th century and I think before that as well. So this is called The Assistant Marshal Makes an Error in Judgment. And this is based on the 9th United States Census dated June 18, 1870, Macon County, North Carolina. So keep in mind, this is right after the Civil War. Even though he has read and reread best he can the instructions sent direct from Washington, even though he employs a sturdy portable ink stand, quality ink he blots dry with unpracticed diligence on strictly confidential wide white sheets. Even though important scientific results depend upon his questionable R's and two short L's, tedious name of name, age, occupation, and color. Assistant Marshal J.T. Reeves, who some call carpetbagger, now sits amiably on the porch with one Willis Guy Farmer, age 59, and reads back to Mr. Guy all he has written so mistakes may be corrected on the spot. The marshal is not from around these parts, and Mr. Guy, previously known as Mulatto, previous to that known as Free Colored Person, if asked, would would claim Catawba, Cherokee, even the dark Portuguese, but figures it best to keep his silence at the government man's ditto of column six. Like that, Mr. Guy and all his kin become white. Mr. Guy would admit he isn't as good at letters as his children, but squinting sideways at the marshal's ledger, he knows the unmistakable difference between W and M. Um, so, of course, that is that is imagined, um, an imagined encounter between an assistant marshal who was performing the census back in Macon County, North Carolina in 1870, and, um, and like I said, my third great-grandfather. But it is a matter of fact that that family was, um, was mulatto. And for, you know, several decades or free colored person, depending on the year that the census was being taken, exactly what the language was. And that is the year that they became white. And it sure is interesting to imagine how did that you know come to pass? And my own theory is that um, in prior years, the census taker would have been someone who lived around there. But because it was right after the Civil War, um, the, the census uh, takers had been brought in um, from the uh, probably the D.C. area, and um, and so they wouldn't have known people, and they might have just looked at someone and thought they looked white. Anyway, keep looking to the side here because I have to keep an eye on the time, but I see I'm running pretty pretty good here. Um, I'll turn to another question or two. Uh, Mike James, who lives here in Murfreesboro and is another Tennessee poet that you should look up, um, sent this question to me. Uh, He said, here's what I would like to know. I'm basically a hermit. 
I work, I read, I write, I do a few things with my cats and kids. How did you decide to get involved in promoting poetry, and how do you think your ongoing public involvement feeds your writing? Well, I think that, you know, I kind of spoke to that a little bit when I was talking about Mary Catherine's question with regards to community and social justice and things that are going on, but in a more direct way in terms of serving the community, Mike's question gives me a great chance to mention Poetry in the Borough. Um, Poetry in the Borough is a monthly event and a community that sometimes offers workshops and and gets involved in other projects and outreach um, here in Murfreesboro. And it serves a number of people throughout the entire Middle Tennessee region as well. Um, And I started it about four years ago because I had been going back and forth to Nashville for poetry events, and I got stuck on the interstate at like 9.30 at night. It may have even been coming back from a Scarrett Bennett reading. I don't remember for sure, but I got caught in a traffic jam, and it really irritated me that, you know, at 9.30 at night, I would still be in a traffic jam. And um, and so I sat there with my uh, hands on the steering wheel fuming and, and literally said, isn't Murfreesboro big enough that we could have our own poetry event. Um, And um, there have been, of course, uh, numerous writing groups. There are numerous writing groups and and all that have um, been here in Murfreesboro and Smyrna and Rutherford County for years. Um, But we, we really didn't have something that I think got advertised out to the public a whole lot. And um, so I partnered with the Borough Art Crawl and got some other poets involved, Allison Boyd Justice and Denise Satterfield Wilson. And we kind of made up a few uh, goals for this event. And um, the first time we met, I would have been really happy if five or 10 people came. And I think we had something like 27 because I had 22 chairs. So there were people sitting on a concrete floor in the back room of a pub. And, um, and you know, I knew then that it was something that the community needed. And so uh, since the pandemic, we are um, doing virtual events, and that's changed what we do a little bit. Um, mostly we're just doing open mic and not so much featured readers right now. But um, but we are still staying connected and we're, you know, putting out a word challenge every month and uh, we will have a calendar for the first time in 2021 um, that is being made possible by our current poet laureate of Murfreesboro, Amy Whittemore. Um, She and I are working on that project and it will be paired with uh, the work of local photographers. So we're very excited about that. Um, Amy. Uh, received a grant um, that's helping make that possible. And I wish the right words were coming to me at the moment. But anyway, I'll put something in the comments uh, about about that. But I'm really proud of her um, and am proud of, of what we are accomplishing. Um, now, you know, does this feed my writing? Well, again, I think somewhat. Now, to be honest, sometimes I feel like an arts administrator. I mean, I'm doing a lot of work for Poetry in the Borough and also for the Rutherford Arts Alliance. Um, But at the same time, I just, I spent so many years just working and, and, you know, being involved with my family. And, and that was really most of what I had time for. Um, my extracurriculars usually were related to what my kids were doing and, and so forth. And so now it just feels really good to me to have a little more time to be able to um, be involved in the community and, um, and to hopefully give in, in this way. So that's enough about that. Um, how about a few more poems? So I haven't read you any mammal poems yet. Um, as I like to call them. Um, My grandmother was quite a storyteller, and um, she 
uh, told stories about growing up in the country uh, in in Georgia. She told a lot of stories about um, her p- parents, about her grandparents, um, about the the native people that uh, that she was descended from. And she also told a lot of ghost stories that just, you know, scared the bejeebies out of me. Um, and which I found out a lot later were, were probably pretty standard Appalachian tales, but I sure didn't know that at the time. And, and she had me convinced that they had all happened directly to her. Um, but um, let me read this poem to you, inspired by her. It's called, When the Watched Pot Boils. You know time is getting by, and you try to remember all she told you. Use both dark meat and white. Save bone and skin and gristle for the cat. Roll the dough thin as a paper sack. Slice it into strips no wider than your thumb. You'd give up sweets for a month to hold again her wood-handled knife, its old blade so often sharpened it was almost gone. You think of these things as you stand at the stove, the kettle's broth rolling. Think of the story she told. That time a door-to-door peddler tried to snatch her youngest. That hot night she and her lover broke every dish in the house. That Sunday, the kids ate their own pet rooster for lunch. Reminding you, chicken and dumplings need plenty of salt. You taste that name passed down to her, Tennessee, and she is with you, barefoot, stirring the pot, one eyebrow raised. That hard T, that soft S, the irony, she was born in Georgia and lies now all too soon in Alabama soil. Some things are never right. Some things are not better with time. But maybe her name was perfect. After all, how many of the stories she told had a happy ending? Now, here is another mammal story. This poem is called Untold Story. She was religious about reading aloud, Ann Lander's advice in the free press, jello salad recipes in good housekeeping, letters and postcards from cousins, and that one odd relation all the way in Australia. But neither of us ever said a word about the National Enquirer, which she'd pick up in the Winn-Dixie checkout next to the gum and chocolate bars, as if it were essential as milk and sugar. Back from the grocery on a summer afternoon, she'd start supper and I'd slip away to the overwarm sanctuary of her modest living room. Thin floral carpet, knotty pine walls, and a nubby mauve sofa where I, a sensitive and impressionable child, would spread the tabloid and kneel before it to absorb cover to cover and back again until my knees ached the gospel of my disbelief. A moon landing hoax, an alien abduction, a two-headed motherless kitten nursing a domesticated squirrel, and of course the secret lives of stars. What is it that makes us want to swallow a story whole? To think only one version can be true. We were not true disciples, but my grandmother tended the altar of narrative possibilities. This woman with an eighth grade education, who I never saw reading a book. So that's inspired by many summers with with my mamaw. And um, and she really would pick up that National Enquirer, which I think young people may not know what that is, but that is a 
you know, uh, that was fake news before you really ever heard the 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 term fake news. Um, and it did have a lot of sensational news. And I, th I think they still publish online, but a lot of sensational news. And um, you'd pick it up, you know, right with all the other magazines in the checkout uh, aisle. And my mother would not have let me read that trash, but Mamma didn't mind. And um, and so I couldn't wait to get back to the house and 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 read it. Um, and, uh, anyway, and Memo actually was, was quite a reader and writer as well, even though, uh, in the poem, I refer to the fact that she did only have an eighth grade education. I think, uh, of course, when I was with her, she didn't have time to be reading a book either, but, um, uh, but definitely she was, uh, something of a, of a writer and philosopher as was, is her daughter, my, my mom. And, uh, and, of course, it came down to me as well. Um, I want to finish with just a couple of poems. Um, and I want to mention several other people sent questions. And I think I'm going to make just some shorter videos to address some of those because they are really good. Um, one, I want to mention Ron. My friend Ron said, do you set a time, set aside time every day to write? Do you have a method? Do you wait for inspiration? Um and that has changed for me over the years, uh, for for certain, um, because when I was busier, it was harder to to work in time, um, and I tended to write at night. Now I like to write in the morning, um, kind of do the morning pages uh, sort of thing. What's on your mind, and then um, a lot of times that will turn into a poem. But I keep everything. I write longhand, and I keep everything, and then maybe. Three months or six months or a year later, I go back through and I find those little phrases or sometimes a draft of a poem and you go, oh, this looks like it might be something. And so that tends to be how I often generate work. Um, and, and particularly this year, now that I'm getting over the phase of promoting Sugar Fix and, and having a little more time to think about um, a new poetry book, um, it turns out I've been, you know, kind of writing towards something, I think, for two or three years and, and even didn't quite realize the themes that were showing up um, so much until I really started going back through and, and collecting those things together. So there are no rules. The rule is just show up. Just show up to the page and see what happens. That's doesn't matter when you do it. Um, but do carry a notebook or do the audio recorder thing or something because you know, so often you'll have a good idea and it's so, so easy to forget that later on. So get down those little brilliant ideas when you have them. Um, I'm going to end with two poems. And again, thank you so much for um, being with me today and for your comments as we've gone along in the uh, in the watch party. I really appreciate that so much. Um this is probably my favorite poem in the book. Um, you know, all of these. So I, I like narrative poems, as you've figured out by now, poems that tell a story. And so many of these different little stories um, are different speakers. And I don't quite know who this woman is. Um, but as I like to tell folks, I just wish she'd come back and, and you know, narrate a whole novel to me. Uh, and the title just goes right into the poem, so I'm just going to jump into it. He drove a four-door Chevy, nothing sexy, but I'd been thinking of his mouth for weeks when he finally called me up and asked if I'd like to get some ice cream. Well, I was full from supper, and my thighs sure didn't need it, but I've never struggled with priorities. That Dairy Queen had gone downhill even then. Bright red logo, faded like a movie star who's kissed away all her lipstick. But it still had a drive-in, and he knew how I was about nostalgia and sugar. This is how a place became our song. We parked under the sun-bleached canopy, and I leaned over him, pretending to read the menu. Then at his rolled-down window, we confessed our desires more or less into thin air which now that I think about it, sounds a little like church. And believe you me, I'd been praying about him. How I wanted him. How if I couldn't have him, I wanted to be free of want. 
Do you get that way sometimes? Where all you can think about is chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. Or in my case, man, man, that man. The bench seat of his Chevy became a pew, the space between as palpable as the early summer humidity. I kept telling myself, it's just an ice cream. But even then I knew love is a kind of ruin. When those cones arrived so thick and voluptuous, I almost blushed to open my mouth before him, expose my eager tongue. And I'm going to end with um, a poem called As the Story Goes. Um, and this poem is um, styled after a poem by Vandana Khanna, uh, whose work I really love. She's got a book called Afternoon Masala. Uh, and in that book uh, of poetry, there's a poem that's called Insignificant Beginnings. And um, so um, I was inspired by that to write my own origin story. And I share this with you because I know a lot of you who are watching are writers. And I think it's just, um, it's a really nice structure to consider your origin story and in particular this um, layout. So um, I'll try to share this poem in the comments as well so you can take a look and, and maybe work on your own. As the story goes, before I was born in a city that loves the taste of marshmallow pies, a sign, a gypsy peddler jangling pans and fortunes, telling me to sing, to move, to grow ever restless of the same view. My mother, nourished nine months by Burger King, on the day of my birth ate an apple ripe as her small womb. She would need the doctor, curse his knife. My father, just back from service, all square shoulders and cleft chin, searched for the job that would keep him from us, hours and holidays, swearing duty, food on the table. These facts melt warm and familiar as spun sugar on my tongue. But I started longer ago, as a ship that lost its way, as the rain and muck of a wilderness trail, as the shelter of a cave as a place called Sugar Fork, where bats at twilight once circled and swirled like Cherokee dancers, where against a sky darker than spent earth, stars float still like manna, a hope that never fell. May you have hope that does not fall. Thank you so much for joining me, for the gift of your attention. Um, again, Sugar Fix is available anywhere that you buy books. Um, Parnassus in Nashville has had it in stock and can get it if they're, if they're out of them. Um, your favorite indie bookstore, um, it's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, if you would like a signed copy, you can find uh, a way to order on my site, coreywells.com. Um, I need to put in a, another little advertisement upcoming. I am teaching a workshop on Saturday, October 3rd for the MTSU uh, Department of Art and Design. They have a series called Saturdays at Todd. This is online um, and they'll have a registration link uh, posted soon. And I believe there's no cost for that. And then on October 11th and 18th, which are um, Sundays, I believe, um, Kara Kemp and I, who um, Kara produces the Bloom Stage a storytelling um, series, and I help her with that. And we are doing a workshop slash production event. Um, called Square Peg Round Hole for the Tennessee Steam Festival. Uh, and there will be, I'll put a link in the comments to that, but we'll have registration open for it as well pretty soon. Um, looking to see if there's anything else I need to see before I let you go. But I think that's it. And um, again, be well, 
Thank you so much. Thank you to Scarrett Bennett. And um, as we all continue in these challenging times, I just uh, encourage you to find ways to create and know the joy of creating and the connections that that brings. Thank you so much. Bye.